Today I'm going to be learning more about Polish history, in particular Polish military history and a momentous occasion from World War II, one that intrinsically links my country Britain and Poland and that's the story of the 303 Squadron. This is the untold battle of Britain, bloody foreigners. A lot of people have asked me to watch this video before so that's what I'm doing today. Now embarrassingly I never really knew much about the 303 squadron before I started this channel. Only through watching videos and reading people's comments they gave me more information on it and the more I've learnt about it so far, the more as I said I'm embarrassed I never knew about it but the more I, I just love the Polish uh, part of this situation. So to my brief knowledge, it seems like Poland provided and supplied fighter pilots to the Royal Air Force, the British Royal Air Force. And not only were they successful, they were very successful. They became, to my knowledge, some of the most highly respected fighter pilots in the whole of the Royal Air Force. I cannot wait to find out more about them. The only thing that I've learned again since people have been telling me is how shoddily Britain treated Poland after World War II, even after Poland's role in how they fought back against the Germans, how they helped Britain so much and Britain just allowed them to be basically taken over by the Soviets. And I'm embarrassed by that, I feel like it's quite shameful. I also feel it's quite shameful that we don't learn enough about this in the UK when we're learning about history of World War II. So that's what I'm doing today, I'm learning and I want to learn as much as possible. So this is a long one, this is 50 minutes. So I'll try not to stop it too much, but let's just learn as much as we can. Britain, an island nation. We've withstood invasion and foreign influence for centuries, or so we like to think. But look a little closer and you'll find that those who sailed our ships, fought our battles and forged our identity weren't always British. Bloody foreigners. If you go to Trafalgar Square, you go to Nelson's Common, and you look closely, you will see a black sailor. Allies fight! Always fight! This series tells the story of four iconic events from a surprising new angle that will alter the way we view our history. In the summer of 1940, a desperate battle raged in the skies of England. If Britain lost, Hitler would invade. At the heart of the fight was one remarkable squadron. Brave, rebellious, unconventional. 303 Squadron shot down twice as many Germans and boasted one of the Battle of Britain's greatest aces. The pilots kept a record of their exploits in a unique diary but it isn't written in English. Allied fighter! Polish pilot! 303 Squadron was made up of Poles who came here to fight for freedom and help change the course of British history. How in hell do you think you're gonna fight the Germans if you can't even fly the ruddy aeroplane? My men did not come all this way to sit around learning English. Using the accounts of the squadron aces and the testimony of the pilots who knew them. Man, this, this is the untold story of the Battle of Britain. This looks good. Only the English Channel and a few hundred RAF pilots stood between Britain and invasion. Now Adolf Hitler stood just as Napoleon had stood more than a hundred years before. As Britain prepared to fight to the death, thousands of Polish servicemen came here, the last free country in Europe. We knew that England would continue fighting, you see, and, and uh, uh, we could sort of join them. They had fled their homeland and crossed Europe. Now the Poles had only one desire to fight the Germans. Our country was defeated. We wanted it back. The commitment was total. The Poles were eager to fight. Britain was short of pilots. There was just one problem. Next. None of them spoke the language. 
The only English words we knew were yes and no. The only problem was knowing which to use. Jan Zumbach had qualified as a pilot two years earlier and already seen action in France. Have you typhus? He described the obstacles he and his fellow airmen faced in his memoir. Have you migraine? We were continually at cross purposes with the British officials. Have you TB? A friend of mine had just about run out of patience when one doctor solemnly inquired. Have you had VD? Had VD? Had VD? What's that? So I <laughs> took a chance. <laughs> Answered. Yes. I must promptly hold off for a vigorous massage of the prostate. Examination, please. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't understand okay. what we were saying, and I'm quite certain we couldn't understand what they were saying, because I myself didn't know a word of English. And that was a great barrier, both socially and, more important, operationally. But Britain was desperate. On July the 22nd, 303 Polish squadron was formed at London's RAF Northolt. To overcome the language barrier, its pilots were placed under English-speaking commanders. Captain John Kent, an experienced Canadian pilot, recalled his reaction at having to chaperone the Poles in his autobiography. It was just about the last straw to find myself posted to a foreign squadron that had not even been formed. I was thoroughly fed up and despondent. Kent wasn't alone in his view. Hello, boy! They didn't think we, we really have any stomach for, for fight anymore. That, that we are a spent force and that we are an embarrassment and a burden. Out of all the po I mean, that, that one is the hardest to understand. These Polish people have literally left their country, travelled so far just to be able to take part in the war. That's incredibly brave. You see these people, they're like, we want to fight, that's what they want. It's only two of them. You can't, like, argue that. Any English at all. Kent's commanding officer was Ronald Kellett. It was his job to turn 303 into a fighting force. The men are being taught basic operational vocabulary. All I know about the Polish Air Force is that they lasted three days against the Luftwaffe. Well, let's hope we can make them shine more brightly operating from England. That's the good way to think about it. Time was running out. Germany's high command wanted to complete the invasion of Britain before the winter set in. In early August, the Luftwaffe intensified its mission to destroy Britain's defences. The Germans had two and a half thousand aircraft. The RAF, just over 600. Angels! Angels! Meanwhile, Zumbach and his fellow pilots were confined to the classroom. Pancake! Every morning, a bus would take us 10 miles to Uxbridge to learn the basic vocabulary which would be coming over the earphones. Pancake! Angels for thousands of feet altitude. Angels! Pancake for landing. Pancake. Bandits for enemy planes and so on. The angel, it's the height. <laughs> you see, there was in thousands, usually. Bandits. Bandits. After three or four weeks of very intense classes, my vocabulary was good enough to say read a paper, but I couldn't pronounce it. Captain John Kent came up with his very own strategy to vault the language barrier. Aeroplane. Air o plane. Samolot. Sam Sam I had to learn some Polish. Sam Olot. I went round the aircraft giving English names for the various parts and getting the Polish in return. Wing. Skrzydła. Skrzydła. Shit. Skrzydła. Skrzydła. Gradually, I worked out a complete procedure in Polish and had it all written down phonetically on my knee pad. It worked very well and amused the Poles a lot. Shit. Kent. Yes. No. Kentowski. <laughs> <laughs> Kentowski. Kentowski. <laughs> Just one more chance. Despite Kentovsky's efforts, the Poles were increasingly frustrated. 
each night I say a little prayer for. It was almost a year since they'd fled Poland. But instead of flying fighters, the British commander Kellett had them training on bicycles. Poles wanted to go to battle straight away, and Kellett didn't want to allow it until they were ready to cope with the radio communications and so forth. They must have been frustrated, just wanted to get in there and help Zobak get in the plane was starting to doubt he would ever get back in the war. Child's play. If the British are wasting so much time with their childish exercises, when all of us have already won ours, how long is it going to take them to train up their young recruits from scratch? And will I eventually get an enemy in my sights before he won the war? <laughs> you man, stop that! We were all very, very eager to get on with the uh, get on with flying, but we had to wait, so we were a bit frustrated. Listen, you're here to train for battle with the Germans and not to fool around and argue with each other. So when exactly will my men start training in hurricanes? Witold Urbanovich was a legendary Polish flying instructor, desperate to get his pilots back in action. I brought my cadets from Poland through Romania, Syria and France. I don't want people crashing around the sky until they understand what they're being told to do. My men did not come all this way to sit around learning English. There's nothing more that we can show the Poles on trainers. Very well. Have the squadron proceed to operational training on hurricanes. That was, that was a great effort by that man. Go for his the soldiers. The 303 were finally back in the air. But before they could fight the Germans, they had to learn to fly in formation, the British way. Perhaps the training period was unnecessarily prolonged, and this certainly irked the pole, but we still had to be quite sure they knew how we operated. Back home, Poles had flown planes with fixed undercarriages. In a British fighter, they had to remember to lower the wheels before landing. Not all of them did. We had several aircraft landed with the undercarriage retracted. One of these was put down by Sergeant Franischek. Stand to attention, Franischek. And I tore him off a first-class trip. Do you have any idea of the damage you've just caused? He didn't know what I was saying, but he knew he had to answer in a foreign tongue and kept repeating. We oui, commandant. Amongst some of the things I said to him was, "How in hell do you think you're going to fight the Germans if you can't even fly the ruddy aeroplanes?" We oui, mon commandant. Go on. Go. Yeah. What Kent didn't know was that Joseph Frantischek had already shot down eleven German aircraft in France. Dismissed. Already a hero. would soon show Kent exactly what he was capable of. Nice. Tell me if any of these pilots are August, still celebrated and still remembered in Poland today. 1940. Britain had lost half its frontline pilots. The saying was that if you uh, lasted the first week of an operational tour, you were probably quite safe. The British believed the German invasion was just weeks away. With recruits as young as 18 being killed quicker than they could be trained, the RAF was losing the battle for Britain. There were chaps who have flown, for example, 15 hours and they were thrown into the battle. A lot of them didn't come back from their first flights. Despite this, the experienced Poles of 303 were still not cleared for action. On the 30th of August, the British commander Ronald Kellett led them on yet another training flight. But this would be a training flight with a difference. As Ludwig Paskiewicz wrote in the squadron diary. After climbing about 10,000 feet, we flew northward. After a while, I noticed ahead a number of aircraft carrying out various turns. Green one! Green one to Aberdeen leader! Man, it's 12 o'clock! 
Paskiewicz was an experienced pilot, but had not yet engaged the enemy in combat. The training flight had strayed into a battle. A German raid was under attack over St. Albans. The sight of the enemy was too much for Paskiewicz. Without waiting for orders from his British squadron leader, he took matters into his own hands. I opened up throttle and went in the direction of the enemy. I noticed that my own altitude and bomber turning in my direction. When he noticed me, he dived sharply down. I turned over and dived after him. I noticed the black crosses on wings. Then I aimed at the fuselage and opened fire from about 200 yards, later transferring it to the port engine, which I set on fire. I drew very close, and I gave him another burst. Almost one year after the invasion of Poland, Ludwig Paskiewicz claimed 303's first victory against the Germans. He hit the ground. That's, that in itself is like such a momentous moment in there to get the first kill, first down of a plane. I mean, I don't know too much about being a pilot, but to see that sort of ingenuity, that quick thinking, I think that's what the 303 Squadron became known for. But that was like the perfect example, just breaking away, using his own feeling, and then getting that, taking that plane out, man. That's like such a nice... Uh, Re, like recapture of that story Down without pulling out of dive and burst into flames i have fired that enemy aircraft for first time in in my life oh. training flights are precisely that training flights that means you don't go gallivanting around the sky shooting up germans the safety of your squadron is your first consideration However, I do feel it is my duty, despite my better judgment, to congratulate Pilot Officer Paskiewicz on making the squadron's first kill. Mm. Sir? Well done. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Very good. Carry on. <laughs> I guess that's the very British regimented way to like, he had talk about safety then in Poland say well and done. France. It was Paskiewicz's first kill. He was hugely elated and so were we. Under the circumstance, sir, I do think that we might call him operational. That night, Kellett put in a call to fight a command. Thank you, sir. The Poles were back in the war. 303's first operational day marked a bitter anniversary. It was exactly a year ago that the Germans had invaded Poland. Naturally, every pilot wanted to share the honor of the first battle. We had to draw lots for the different flights. I was lucky enough to draw the short straw. We're flying. We're flying. <laughs> See, they're so happy to be a part of it. To be active and to fight. We're not fighting for... England or France or thing, we're waiting for our country. Quite right. The pilots knew full well what Nazi invasion meant. In Poland, the wholesale destruction of a people was underway. Schools and colleges had been shut, teachers and doctors shot, and the first prisoners had arrived at a slave labor camp called Auschwitz. Since leaving Poland, Miroslav Ferec had made it his duty to keep a record of events in what became the Squadron Diary. We are surprised that Adolf isn't taking advantage of this beautiful weather. You'd think he'd be bombing so hard you could hear echoes across the island. But it hasn't started. It was Ferec, you see, that, was, that kept the diary. And he would invite other pilots to make a contribution 
Well, I was never invited to that, you see. I was too small of a little minnow, you see, in the, among the aces. <laughs> What's going on? Maybe it's a lack of personnel. <laughs> He's planning something. Organizing day-long wait, at 5.50, the Poles were finally scrambled for action. Fighter Command radar detected 200 German aircraft crossing the channel. Red leader, red leader. Man, 303 was about to be tested in battle for the first time. Hit the targets and go get them. Ferrich had fought the Germans in Poland in outdated aircraft. Now he experienced his first dogfight with the enemy in a modern British fighter. I caught up with him easily. He grew my sights until his fuselage fit the whole luminous circle. It was certainly time to fire. I did so quite calmly and was not even excited, rather puzzled and surprised to find that it was so easy. Quite different from Poland, where you had to scrape and strain until you were in a sweat. And then instead of getting the bastard, he got you. These Polish, uh, they loathe the Germans. All we were interested in was to destroy airplanes, whereas the Poles, they wanted to kill anybody that was in these airplanes. Yeah, especially after what happened to Poland, that's quite uh, understandable or what the Germans were doing to Poland at that time as well. In less than 15 minutes of furious vengeance, each of the six pilots of Kellett's flight had shot down a Messerschmitt. Witold Urbanovich recorded their spectacular first day in the squadron diary. Well, this is dated the 31st of August, 1940. And there's actually a, a, an illustration here of the action that went on. I'm looking to see if there's an indication of how well it went. The exact count I can't tell by the writing, but I get the sense that this, this, this was a, uh, a very successful engagement. Here they are! <laughs> Our squadron leader took us by Rolls Royce to the orchard in Ryslip. They had found out on the grapevine that the Poles had brought down six Messerschmitts and they were celebrating. The orchard, well, it's a nice big bar uh, with a very pretty barmaid. That was <laughs> the important thing. They wanted to drag us into the middle of the dance floor, but we wouldn't let them. We don't want to make a song and dance about our achievements. Very humble. The news of the Poles' success had spread far beyond the orchard. From the Chief of Air Staff, Sir Cyril Newell. Magnificent fighting, 303 Squadron. I'm delighted. The enemy has shown that Polish pilots definitely on top. Congratulations. Whoa. 303 Squadron has opened its account with a vengeance. <laughs> this is so, so interesting, so enjoyable as well. The Poles had joined the battle just in time. Hitler's planned invasion was thought to be only weeks away. Repeat again, please, Goddard. Captain John Kent, the skeptical Canadian chaperone, was with 303 over the south coast on the second day in action. Realize we are only six. Kent's flight of six planes faced 150 enemy aircraft. Kent described how the Poles dealt with such overwhelming odds in his autobiography. Sergeant Rogowski, who was doing search formation behind, pulled up and went head on into the middle of them, closely followed by Franchek. The German formation split up and a general melee ensued. Kent watched amazed as the Poles flew head-on at the enemy bombers. 
With a closing speed of over 600 miles an hour, the slightest error would be fatal. Streams of gray trace of smoke crisscrossed the sky in all directions. It was impossible to hold a steady aim. And snap shooting was the order of the day. In the frenzied dogfight, a Messerschmitt repeatedly latched onto Kent. But each time it closed in for the kill, it was chased off by a Polish pilot. Whoa. Great teamwork as well. Kent was certain of one thing. The Poles hadn't learned to fly like this in England. Mm. Wow. I mean, tell me if you know, if you've heard about that moment in particular, being so outnumbered, I mean, that's crazily outnumbered. Again, as I mentioned, I don't know much about flying, I don't know much about being a pilot, but that tactic of just going straight towards them, again, seeing and hearing about that incredible bravery, but just an amazing strategy, amazing tactic as well, is that something that must be very uncommon, I don't know. Uh, but already you can see how impressed the British are with the Polish uh, pilots and I guess this is like the perfect example of it in that moment. Back at Northolt, Sergeant. Kent did his best to express his gratitude. Thanks for keeping that hun off my tail. The hun off my tail. Okay. Not one, Mr. Schmidt. Six. There's a team. They all, that's, but not they're all very humble. Three had returned to base. But In help defiance each other. of orders, Joseph Frantischek and another pilot were harrying Germans all the way back to France. Frantischek had a habit of departing from the squadron and hunting on its own, which was <laughs> perhaps against the discipline. But at the same time, because of his individual expeditions, his victories mounted. Jeez. A Czech pilot who had joined the Poles when his own country surrendered, was well on his way to becoming one of Britain's highest scoring aces. <laughs> Chasing them home? <laughs> on his own? What a guy. From Air Vice Marshal Keith Park. Group commander appreciates the offensive spirit that carried two Polish pilots over the French coast in pursuit of the enemy today. This practice is not economical or so sound now that there is such good shooting within sight of London. Ooh. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm killing Germans. Many excellent pilots have died due to lack of discipline. Do you want to become one of them? I fly alone. I can kind of see it from both sides. In a unique compromise, it was wow. agreed. You go just from appreciate now on, it. Frantischek could leave formation to hunt alone. Jeez. You gotta appreciate a, a man like that. That's who you in want just six days in your sight. 303 shot down 24 enemy aircraft without the loss of a single pilot. We were one fighting family. Together we dreamed of a brighter tomorrow, when after the war, we would return to our motherland. As the battle entered a bloody new phase, the Poles would be at the heart of the defense of Britain. In this historic battle, this is so good. the mightiest air force after the British is the Polish Air Force. Every day we are winning against the Germans. In just one week, the Poles of 303 had overturned British prejudice and proved their fighting spirit. On the afternoon of September the 7th, they shot down 16 enemy aircraft in less than 15 minutes. <laughs> It was a record unbeaten by any other RAF squadron. Whoa. Next Gentlemen, level. Be vigilant and careful to preserve your lives. Poland will need you at the end of this war. Mm. 
That same day, the German war machine unleashed its fury on a new target, London. Millions of firebombs rained down on the great city of London. Hitler's planned invasion was imminent. In preparation, the Luftwaffe attempted to smash the spirit of the British people. As he flew over the capital, 303's Canadian captain John Kent witnessed the aftermath of the first day of the Blitz. I could see the fires that the Luftwaffe had started on this, the first raid on London. I had not realized that I could feel so deeply. But at that moment, I would have butchered any German I could lay my hands on. I was beginning to understand the attitude of the Poles. They're very much like us. We found that, uh, apart from the language and uh, national differences, that uh, th th we thought and they thought more or less on the same lines, mm. which was uh, kill the Hun. But not everyone believed a handful of ill-disciplined Poles could be shooting down so many Germans. Chief skeptic was their own group captain, Stanley Vincent. Treat these claims with a lot of reserve. Sir? I want you to go through them with a fine tooth comb. Yes, sir. But Vincent didn't wait for the intelligence officer's report. When the Poles took off on the 11th of September, Vincent went on his very own spying mission. He followed the 303 going into action, and he kept his distance and wanted to see how, how they do. He wanted to find out for himself. He didn't have to wait long. Bandits, three o'clock. A veteran of the First World War, Vincent had never seen flying like this. The Poles had jumped in on the scattered individuals and suddenly the air was full of burning aircraft, parachutes and pieces of disintegrating wings. It was so rapid, it was staggering. The British trained pilots to fire from around 400 yards. The more experienced Poles were able to fly to within 100 yards before they opened fire. The effect was devastating. Take I think the... anybody who was keen, and they were, and some yeah. of us were keener than others, was the closer you got in, the better. A bomber aeroplane is quite a, a large um, target when you get that close. Yeah. Technically brilliant pilots. Every time Vincent tried to get a German in his sights, a Paul dived in front of him and shot down his target. Vincent was transformed from skeptic to believer. I told Wilkins that what they claimed they did indeed get. Any luck, sir? My God. They're doing it. Sir? <laughs> Grandma! <laughs> the success of 303 Polish Squadron was becoming a powerful weapon of British propaganda. Squadron leader Urbanovich is watching his boys getting into formation. It'll be known within an hour or so whether a German plane has been shot down or maybe two or three or even more Germans. Good luck. <laughs> Brilliant, man. This is so good. But news Absolute of the success machines. of the exiled airmen was most powerful back home. I was only 14, but I wanted to join the Polish Air Force. Unfortunately, I was arrested in June 1943 and after interrogation by Gestapo, I was sent to Auschwitz concentration camp and spent the rest of my war <laughs> in the Auschwitz concentration camp. So my aviation dreams were shattered in that, <laughs> in, in that sense. He's laughing about that. 303's success in the defense of Britain had turned Polish pilots into what one paper called the glamour boys of England. There was a sort of aura of romance about Falls. A policeman was standing by the car. He wanted to know why the car was left in the street without its lights on. 
At first, they didn't know what to make of us, but once we had a better grasp of English, the social life improved. Would you leave a car like this outside a cinema in Poland? <laughs> no, we said, in Poland, we, we ride to the, the cinema, cinema on, on horses. horses. <laughs> they all had the finest reputation, bowing and the kissing of hands, which, I mean, was completely unknown to some English people. It seemed over the top, and it also seemed if they did that sort of thing, could they be trusted? My name is Jan Zombay. Gentlemen as well. The girls were nice and friendly, and so were their mothers. Do you like to dance? <laughs> so were their mothers. And fathers, well, the fathers were absent, most of them. I'm not surprised that the English girl went up after the Polish boys. Mm, but the Polish uh, uh, men, they like to show off. Is that true? <laughs> She put her record on and clung even tighter than she had on the dance floor. Five minutes later, we came up for air and she withdrew into the bathroom. <laughs> came up for air. <laughs> Zumbak discovered it wasn't just the pilots of 303 keeping a diary of their exploits. Even my limited English vocabulary was equal to this kind of subject matter, especially with the clues provided by the names of several members of my squadron. <laughs> she had awarded them high marks in contrast to her rather disparaging assessment of her own countrymen. <laughs> by more uh. rapid reckoning, her survey was based on a sample of approximately 30. <laughs> Oh. Zumbak did not reveal the marks <laughs> awarded to number 31. <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> I'm always crying, it's good stuff. The British believed Hitler's planned invasion was just days away. On the 15th September, the Luftwaffe launched what it intended to be a final knockout blow to destroy mm -hmm. London and Britain's morale. This day would decide the fate of Britain and stretch every pilot to breaking point. A 400 strong enemy armada crossed the channel. At 11.15, the poles were scrambled and thrown into battle. I had shot down a donier, then had to hide in the clouds with a bunch of Messerschmitts in hot pursuit. Even for experienced pilots like Zumbak, the stress of two weeks' combat had taken its toll. For the first time in my life, I was really afraid. The fear makes everybody cautious. Uh, so the degree of fear is a good thing. Mm. The, the important thing is to overcome the fear. And naturally, longer you fly, that process of initial fear, of overcoming the fear, wears you out. Everybody was afraid at one time or another. You don't know what the hell is going to happen, where are you going, and, and how the other side will react. Seconds seem to pass like minutes. You live in a kaleidoscope of rage and icy detachment, continually alternating fits of attack and escape, now freezing, now sweating. Then, suddenly you emerge with a shock of surprise into a peaceful sky, as if you died and been reborn into another world. You black out if you're in a turn. It's dangerous, mm -hmm. because it's the time when you're blacking out, you can't see, you don't know who is behind you. myself together and managed to knock out one of the chasing Messerschmitts before running for cover. I had to fade into a fat cloud bank, keeping an eye on my surroundings through gaps in the clouds. In the first epic battle of the day, 303 helped stop the German bombers reaching the targets and claimed 10 kills. But the squadron joker, Zumbak, was to run out of luck. 
Messerschmitt specially used to come in, dive, and out. You know, in the air, when you're there, it's all in seconds. Oh, I've been hit several times. I've been down twice, only twice. And each time, I got away, <laughs> you see. That's what I was going to say. Is, as much as it's amazing to celebrate how good these pilots were and how successful they were, just got to imagine what they're going through every time they step in that plane, every time they fly, how physically, emotionally, psychologically demanding and tiring, exhausting it is. Every time putting their life in danger, putting their life on the line to defend Poland, to help Britain. It's such a huge stress for these young men, like, it's things that we just take for granted. We go about our day-to-day -day life and just enjoy our life and have maybe a little bit of stress at work. But this is just a different level. Every day they're out there fighting for freedom. And that's why we should never forget people like this, especially the success is great, but just the actual sacrifice they made uh, for themselves, for their country, for our country as well. And s potentially seeing their comrades, their, uh, their fellow friends, soldiers, their life sometimes being taken as well. It's bound to be friends, I told myself. You're as good as in prison. I carefully fold my parachute, feeling pleased with myself for having kept hold of the ripcord. The sign of a cool head. Some men appear and fire each time I make the slightest move. They all come to a halt. Except for one man who approaches with a peculiar weaving walk. He's pissed, I think. So I took out my pistol, held it at arm's length, and threw it away. Then I see his uniform. It's British. At the top of my voice, I yell out, Fighter! Polish pilot! Sorry I fired! I, <laughs> I didn't aim at you! Then why did you fire? <laughs> I threw my gun away! To stop you moving! You're standing in the middle of a minefield! Ooh. Zumbak was out of the fight. But the biggest day of the Battle of Britain was only halfway through. On the afternoon of the 15th of September, a second wave of German bombers pressed home their attack. As the battle neared its climax, every available aircraft was scrambled to fight for the survival of Britain. Up to 10 o'clock, 175 German aircraft had been destroyed in today's raids over this country. The Poles had only nine aircraft left. At 2.25, they were scrambled to help repel a 300-strong enemy force. Between 350 and 400 enemy aircraft were launched in two attacks against London and South East England. About half of them were shot down. Only seven aircraft made it back to Northolt. Five were so badly shot up, Kellett said they were fit only for scrap. Jeez. Today was the most costly for the German Air Force for nearly a month. Against immeasurable odds, the RAF held its own. The losses were so high that Luftwaffe High Command realized that they won't be able to achieve air supremacy. Oh. That, I mean, that's the momentous moment when the Luftwaffe come to that sort of conclusion. And it's... So much uh, of that is down to these Polish fighters. Such an amazing moment, these two like military, these two air forces, the Polish and the British, coming together under the Royal Air Force and being able to achieve that, achieve that goal, making the Luftwaffe lose all hope. But to achieve air supremacy, his plan to break Britain from the air had failed. Two days later, Hitler postponed the invasion. Whoa. Whoa. Look at that plane. 
That same day, Joseph Frantischek, who hunted alone, became the first 303 pilot to receive a British medal for bravery. This pilot has taken part in practically every operational flight carried out by this squadron. He has shown great gallantry in always attacking vastly superior numbers of enemy aircraft. With 17 confirmed kills, Frantischek became the highest scoring Allied ace in the Battle Jeez. of Britain. Wow. He was killed less than a month later. Oh. 303 Squadron had shot down twice as many Germans as the leading British unit for a third of the losses. On the 26th. See that again, that is an amazing stat. The leading British unit. 303 Squadron had shot down twice as many Germans as the leading British unit for a third of the losses. On the 26th of September, King George VI made the first of many visits to congratulate the Poles. He was so proud, so we knew that means something, Poland. Yes. The keeper of the squadron diary, Miroslav Ferric, made sure that the king ended up in the book. Whiskey, gin, sherry, oh. cherry brandy. Precisely why I'm not drinking. The mischief me! No, I don't care what it's called. Operational for under one month, on the 27th of September, 303 notched up their 100th kill. But the squadron's pride in its extraordinary success was overshadowed by a tragic loss. Ludwig Paskiewicz, the pilot who broke formation to make 303's first kill, mm. had been shot down. Ah. He was only the fifth pilot of 303 to die. Jan Zumbach commemorated him in the squadron diary. He was one of our best friends. A brilliant pilot, in love with his role. He gave his life to flying, and flying took his life. He did not die of natural causes or in an accident. He died in battle, having achieved what he'd always dreamed of, victory. A hero. He will be welcomed to the squadron of heaven. To Pasha. Zumbach was shot down in 1945. So close to the But end survived. Of he later became a smuggler, mercenary, and ran a nightclub in Paris. The war had more than four years to run. But by October 1940, the Battle of Britain was over. Most historians agree that the Battle of Britain was won by a narrow margin. And it could be argued that perhaps this narrow margin was uh, supplied by the 303 Squadron. Mm. It is with sure. genuine regret and sorrow that I terminate my association with the finest squadron the RAF has ever seen. Captain John Kentowski left 303 to lead his own squadron. My profound thanks for keeping me alive and teaching me how to fight. I'll never mind the flannel. In the book. Miroslav Ferric was killed on patrol in 1942. His precious diary was continued in his memory. Mm. By the end of the war, the 303 Squadron diary filled seven volumes. I wonder if that's available anywhere online, like maybe translated to English. It seems like a very important uh, document or some in doc uh, documents. Uh, seeing that there's so many of them, but can only imagine the detail in there, how interesting it must be to actually read. None of the 303 aces who fought in the Battle of Britain are alive today. 
Every year, a dwindling band of veterans gather at the Polish Memorial at Northolt to honour the fallen and keep their stories alive. And that's what people should do, keep those stories alive. This is my highest decoration, Virtuti Militari. It's one of the highest Polish decorations for bravery. And here, defence medal, defence of the country, is Britain, uh, you see. Mm. 1,973 Polish airmen lost their lives in the Second World War. But in spite of their sacrifice, Poland would be denied its freedom when the war ended. In February 1945, with victory in sight, the Allied leaders met at Yalta. Britain, which had gone to war to defend Poland, now faced the growing power of the Soviet Union. Yalta was complete reversal of the British stand and it was terrible shock for the Polish forces which fought so valiantly. To pacify Stalin, at the end of the war, the Allies handed control of Poland to the communists. Mm. The dream of freedom the Poles had fought and died for was over. The Western Allies won their war. Everybody won except us. We lost. It's like so unfair, man. I mean, first, first we'll just talk about the first part of the documentary, of course, about how brave I, I'll, I'll watch the rest of this in a moment. But just, I absolutely appreciate those Polish fighters. Just every Polish soldier, every Polish person uh, who sacrificed their life uh, to win that war, to see how they were treated afterwards is... I, I, find, I find it very angering, even just me being British, Never mind the Polish people must be so upset and so un pissed off about it, like getting that lack of support at that time. Uh, and that changed history, handing the Soviets control of Poland for the next 35 years, 40, was that, yeah, 45 years under Soviet control and the problems that came along with that. Polish people should have been treated a lot better. The Pol Poland as a country should have been tr treated a, a lot better by Britain and the other allies as well. They should have fought to let Poland be free. Uh, let's watch the rest of this first. Story. In June 1946, Britain held a spectacular Allied victory parade. Czechs, Chinese and Iranians all marched down the Mall past King George VI. But not a single Pole. My father was on the sidelines as, as the parade was going down the Mall, not only given no credit for it, but, but basically being uh, denied existence. That's a disgrace. It broke his heart. Plain and simple, it broke his heart. Not one of the 200,000 Poles who fought fascism marched with the Allies that day. Jesus. Britain did not invite them for fear of offending Stalin. Oh. Even back here, like people so scared to offend other people, that's an absolute disgrace. I thought like people being so easily offended, being offended by things was a very modern thing. Back here in 1945, 1946, the Polish should have been one of the first sets of people, sets of soldiers, whatever, they should have been one of the first people that were invited to this. This is the country that took most of the brunt of what what happened in the war by the Germans. The country was decimated, their people were decimated, and they still, they still crossed out like half the continent to help Britain and to fight for Poland as well under the RAF. They should have been like, celebrated as heroes. Allied really betrayed us. We were absolutely shattered. We were in despair, really, what to do. And what about you, Ivanovitz? Do you go back to Poland? The papers are saying you should go home. Rebuild your country. There's no work for you here now. No. You know what brought us to France and to here. 
You have won the war, but we have lost it. Witold Urbanovich did later return to Poland. Accused of spying, he had to flee to America. Other pilots were not so lucky. A lot of my friends did go back, and some of them, or a lot of them actually, uh, made a sticky end. Unless you were a communist, you said, there was no future for you. At the end of the war, we were really not wanted in this country anymore. There is so many of us, and uh, we are competing for the jobs. People didn't really mind where we go, didn't, didn't particularly uh, press, press us to go here, or they just get out of the country, leave, go back to Poland, or go anywhere you like. I think we've never been really welcome by English, really welcome. That's for sure. Mm. Rather, some may be polite and so, because we know all the English politeness, but, uh, but not as a real welcome to this country, Polish people. I don't know why not. Oh, man. That was such an amazing documentary until the realities of that last five minutes, yeah. So it's, oh, that's heartbreaking how those Polish people were treated, those Polish soldiers, those Polish heroes, how they were treated in the end after everything they gave uh, for Britain specifically, for the Allies, for themselves. So many gave their lives, so many gave up this, I mean, so many fought for that war to be won, be treat, to, to be treated so shoddily at the end of all of that. It's not even treated like just like, oh, thanks, like, we see, it's like almost treated like disgracefully, like they were the enemy, like get out of our country. It was just like unbelievable, man, absolutely horrible. I feel so bad for them, man, and I can see why Polish people would be quite rightly pissed off about that, man. Yeah, it pisses me off as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, first we just got to give credit to those Polish pilots absolute heroes, just technically brilliant, brave, intelligent, brilliant fighters out there every day giving everything and just being so successful, absolutely brilliant story that more people in the UK should learn about and should know about, uh, definitely we should, these, these are the sort of things we should be taught in school. But yeah, again, at the end, just in knowing now what Poland had to go through over that those coming decades after this, under Soviet control, just makes it even worse. Sent back to that, as they say, they never never won the war technically because they still had to live under another country's rule, and it was obviously not what they wanted. Thankfully, now Poland's in a much better place, and much better place you can say than Britain is at the moment as well. So I just wish all the best for Poland in the future as well. I will always support Poland now that I've learned so much about the country. I absolutely love everything about it, and yeah, an amazing story. Thank you for from a British person. I appreciate it at least. I know a lot of normal British people would really appreciate the Polish people and the Polish role in this this. These, uh, this battle and in the war so thank you for that and yeah tell me what you think about this what you know about it thank you